I realize there's always a a life cycle, emotional life cycle when you come across a deal, mm. right? When you see something you really like, and there's this implicit kind of uh, emotional bias to try to justify why this is a good deal. <laughs> uh, I learned to kind of step back and let it simmer and maybe cool down a little bit and re-examine as objectively as possible. Again, using a very first principles kind of thinking around that, mm. Mm. Uh, but. That was learned through mistakes. That's learned through losing money. That's learned <laughs> through companies that you were so sure about that just didn't work out. Right. A lot of these deals that were done, and then you go, you know, sort of justify why these are good deals with theories and hypotheses mm. that sounded great on paper. Right. But the bottom line is, you know, uh, all the first principle stuff we talked about before, mm. and so I think those those are kind of uh, the key transition. Right? Yeah. As a an ex operator, you want to believe. Right. And when you do believe, you believe really, really hard right. in something. Right. Right. That's the nature of an optimist right. founder or <laughs> right. operator, right? Right. At least stage founder. Welcome to the MHV podcast. We speak with leading founders, VCs, and operators on their journey in Southeast Asia. Learn more at www.monkshill.com. Hey, Koi, great to have you on the MHV podcast. Uh, so excited to have you. Uh, so many people look up to you across Southeast Asia as someone who is a great coach, a great investor, and a great human. Uh, so excited to have you share about yourself and the early days. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, excited to be here. So, Koi, uh, for a lot of people have asked, like, what were you like in the early days uh, as a kid, as a child? Were you rebellious, very studious? Were you uh, free and wild? What were you like? Well, I, I know that's a long time ago, obviously, given how old I am right now. When I was growing up in the in the 80s, um, uh, just to put some vintage on me, those were kind of non-internet days before devices and all that. So you can imagine a lot of the time outside of school was spent either with friends, you know, out in the outdoors, you know, playing games, playing soccer when I was younger. And obviously when, you know, during, you know, secondary school, it was more in you know, extracurricular activities outside of uh, the classroom. So a lot of time was spent uh, playing sports, etc. So not atypical of a lot of Singapore Korean kids that were growing up in the, in the 80s. So not a lot of Game Boys, yeah. not a lot of computers back then. Definitely no internet. <laughs> So what non-internet hobbies were you doing a lot of? Uh, there was a lot of sports, right? There's a lot of sports. You know, I was playing a lot of uh, just, you know, sort of courtyard uh, soccer or football, as we call it, with kids, you know, in my neighborhood when I was growing up. And in, in school, more organized sports, you know, I was uh, on the softball team and so did that quite a bit. Um, I was also in the science, you know, club at, at uh, in, in school as well. So uh, a bit of that too. And, and a bit of stamp collection. It was still a thing back then, right? <laughs> um, so obviously not a thing as much these days, but who knows? Some of my collections could actually be worth something. I got to ask, how did yeah. you get into stamp collection? It was just, you know, friends doing it and yeah. then you got pulled into it. So it was just kind of like, you know, who you hang out with. And, and that's one of the things that, that happened as well. My dad actually collected stamps. So he did a lot of that. So part of that was really kind of you know, inheriting that, that hobby from him as well. In addition to having friends and in the school who does the same thing. So, yeah. What other things did you inherit from your dad other than, you know, stamp collection? Not for me to say, but I think, you know, probably that's probably one of the most biggest thing that I remember uh, that he did and I did as well. So, um, reading, I guess. A lot reading of, uh, attribute. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think, you know, um, my first language was, was Chinese, mm. Mandarin, right? And and there's a lot of that from my dad. So a lot of mm. the you know Chinese literature, you know, uh, that I read, you know, was was when I was much younger than right. than when I was older. Yeah. As you grew up, one of the interesting things was that you went on to do not just do sports, not just do all of the stamp collection, but also uh, put all of that together. And we went to university. So how did you use that to decide what you chose to study, which was much more on the scientific side and engineering side? How did you make that decision? Yeah. Um, I've always studied science in Singapore. For those who are kind of somewhat familiar with the Singapore education system, 
you got kind of a, a um, sort of channel to different focus areas when mm. you you know in school, and so I was you know kind of part of the pre med mm. group. You know, we mm. study the sciences, right, including right. biology. Yeah. So in fact, most of my friends are doctors now, right. and some of the top uh, medical professionals mm. in in Singapore. Um, but no, I did not you know go on to medical school, and I went on to decide to take on engineering instead so there was kind of a natural next step mm. um largely because i think i like the first principles of physics mm. right the approach of first principles in in physics uh, i was really awful at biology i almost i failed my first exam mm. just because i never realized i had to memorize things i'm right. used to just knowing things of the first principles and deriving a lot of stuff from that right right but biology was literally you gotta remember a lot of stuff right. and reproduce a lot of stuff from memory, right. which I was awful at. Right. Um, and although I did do pretty well eventually in biology to possibly make it to medical school, I realized that, you know, my bias is due towards kind of first principles based mm. type topics like physics, chemistry, et cetera. Hence engineering was kind of the the path that I took. Yeah. Uh, enough of that. So and one interesting thing is that you not only chose to start doing engineering, you mm. make it seem like it was something you chose to do because you weren't good at medicine, but you actually chose to double down on it and master it, right? With uh, with advanced degrees in it. So why is it that you chose to double down on it over time? Um, it wasn't a plan. I think it wasn't something that I planned to. So to your point, I, I did my undergraduate in, uh, in EE, in yes. electrical engineering, primarily in... Um, semiconductors, etc., and I eventually I did do a doctorate, a PhD as well in the mm. same field. But truth be told, I think you know, setting out, you know, when I was studying uh, as a freshman uh, in college, I wasn't planning on PhD or a career in academic in the academia. It kind of just happened, you know. I would say that sheepishly, largely because you know um, the opportunity presented itself. Uh, it was a natural kind of mix milestone and achievement i guess to to go for um and the opportunity was there mm -hmm. so and to some extent i was i had the ambition and and probably now a little bit of a mis misguided uh, um ambition that i could have done it quicker <laughs> right uh but also you know i spent eight years in college yeah uh and yeah which included the undergraduate and the graduate programs so but i thought it could have been faster any fun stories about you know eight years in college i mean most people have fun stories from four years of undergrad maybe um, some fun years it was good it was good i think it was uh, also the time when it was the early 90s so um and i was on a financial aid package mm. uh, so part of that was really finding work to mm. pay for mm. tuition and everything. And one of the jobs that I took up, I think I took three jobs, mm. you know, at any one time, um, stacking books in the library mm. and stuff like data entry. Mm. But one of the most in interesting thing and timely thing that I did was to work as a computing help desk consultant. Mm. Interesting. So folks who are kind of like online, trying to use the network computers, et cetera, would you know kind of have any questions we would have once they were helping them with, with the questions and this is in the early 90s so there was you know early stages of the internet uh very early incarnations of network computers uh networks you know uh, applications on top of that you know anything from authentication to you know network directories and storage and file folders to messaging mm. and to emails and video sharing and etc mm. um so it was it was i was you know fortunate right to be right at the uh, the forefront of that and, and to see things happen and that's when i think you know i got my first um sort of exposure to what a network world might look like mm. um and that was yeah that was the early days early days so because i had to make money to pay for stuff to be able to afford college but it also set me up to learn about and be a part of the early internet, uh, which is, I think, fortuitous. And yeah, you know, no complaints. One interesting aspect is that 
it's an interesting inversion, right? Because mm. I also used to be part of that computer help desk as well mm. uh, at a younger age, running around setting up AV cables and help desk for the teachers mm. and things like that. And there's almost like a at that time it was felt like being a help desk was like you know the lagging, right? Or like you were supporting. I don't know. Not really. No, no. Not no yeah, no. In college, yeah. you know, the help desk guys are the ones that. And so, just to be kind of more specific as well, right. this is. Um, uh, I went to MIT, right. so a lot of the early internet stuff was created at right. MIT. Uh, mm. It was a network called uh, Project Athena. Got it. So Athena Network. Um, so a lot of the early stuff, mm. you know, uh, that you see right now, that's underneath the covers mm. of the computers, of the network protocols you're using. Mm of Unix, Linux, et cetera, were, you know, mm. coming through, you know, sort of some of the things that were invented mm. and created uh, through those uh, projects. Um, so no, it was a lot of experimentation. Mm. Um, the Athena um, consultants, as we were called, mm. were very much, you know, sort of helping to mm. solve for some of the early use cases. Mm. Um, some of the folks that we were working with, you know, within MIT, Included guys at SIDB. Mm. Uh, don't ask me what it stands for now. <sighs> Something about you know a publishing board, uh, which is a bunch of hackers, right? right. Guys who are really hacking stuff, right. right? And and trying to extend and stretch and and make things do, make the network and computers do things that they were not meant to do, right? Uh, and so to be kind of like at least on the peripheral, right. Observing that, right? Yeah, no. By no means was it a. Um, kind of like uh, set up the projector <laughs> <laughs> type of role. No, um, it, it was it was fun. It was good. I mean, yeah. it could be paid for it. You know, I can't complain. Yeah, it's interesting that you put it that way because I think for me, it was more like within the computer club, we felt mm. totally fine. It was experimentation. But at that part of time, yeah. you know, in a school of jocks and we were the nerds, it felt like the nerds were a little bit lower than packing order. Right. But I think it's true that MIT, you know, it's a beautiful place where there's a lot of experimentation. Yeah. Everyone's just all... Yeah. I don't think there's that sense of dynamic there. Uh, and I think that's uh, a beautiful part of MIT mm. uh, that's really quite special as well. You know, there's a mm. huge culture of hacking, yeah. uh, experimentation, you know, all the pranks that are being, mm -hmm. being done there as well. What, any beautiful memories about MIT there um, that you liked, that you feel special, that you haven't gotten since, uh, that you, you know, outside of campus? I, I think if there's any one thing that I took away from MIT was just the fact that you know you're never really looking backwards at what has been done or accomplished. Mm. You're always looking at what's possible, what's next, mm. and that's a very deep sense of that across MIT. Mm. As accomplished as a lot of people and majority of the people are at MIT, there was never really a sense of hey, look at what I've done. Mm. Right, the conversation is always about hey what's the next interesting thing to really look into? Right. You know, uh, I have the privilege of working with a lot of, you know, very um, highly renowned scientists, engineers. Um, when I was doing my PhD, uh, some of these guys are Nobel laureate type, you know, folks. And I like to joke that, you know, I, I used to piss, you know, in the toilet next to some of these famous people. <laughs> uh, and the conversations that you have with some of these folks, you know, outside the toilet, it's never really about admiring what they did before. Right. right. It's always about, you know, what's this new thing they were looking at? What are the possible things that we should put in place to experiment, to probe, to explore, to uncover, to discover new possible edges of what we know or we knew back then? And that was a fantastic feeling. And I think that culture of never really being sort of restful on your laurels and just kind of looking ahead is something that I kind of took away from. Right. right? One of the famous uh, anecdotes that people say about the MIT is during commencement, you know, graduation, you see folks, you know, going up there, getting their diplomas, bowing and walking off the stage. The one parting terms that everybody here from the provost who's there on stage is keep moving, mm -hmm. right? That one uh, uh, phrase that you hear as probably the last parting words from MIT before you graduate is keep moving, right? which is cool, which is cool. Although obviously he meant just get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, but at some level it does carry a lot of meaning, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, keep moving. That's a powerful phrase there. There you were and you walked off the stage, right? Mm. With the words keep moving, kind mm -hmm. of ringing in your ears. 
and you made a choice uh, mm. to enter the world. So tell us more about how, what your first job was uh, outside uh, the PhD and why you chose. Yeah, um, you know, uh, one of the, the other things apart from computer um, and and my PhD was in uh, photonics, so mm. semiconductor, lasers, etc. But the other branch of my interest is really in economics, mm. right? So I actually spent a lot of time when I was doing my doctorate at the uh, the management school, <laughs> you know, taking classes in economics with some of the top professors in the world, uh, top management science professors, finance mm. professors, etc. So that was my maybe my you know third branch mm. that I was really interested in business economics and and how that applied you know in the real world. Um, so coming out of the doctorate um, that was in late nineties. I was offered a position at mm. a management consulting firm mm. uh, called the Boston Consulting Group, mm -hmm. and so BCG in short, and so uh, to work with the uh, the high tech uh, team in in the Boston office. So that was my first job. Although I do like to think that my <laughs> first paid job was uh, again still back to being a help desk consultant, and I was paid to do research. Right, I was paid to do research for my PhD. Right. So. But you know, my true first, uh, I guess, full time, you mm. know, career, I guess, outside of the academia, mm. was as a consultant at BCG. Mm. Yeah. And one interesting thing is that you also chose to join BCG, and you mm. also chose not to become a professor, right? Mm. Which is a common uh, path after doing a PhD. Yeah. So why not, you know, continue with the academia route at that point of time? The, the academia was never really my objective for doing the PhD. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, I did my master's. Uh, in fact, I did three theses with the same professor. Mm. You know, mm. my undergraduate bachelor's uh, bachelor's thesis, my master's thesis, and and my doctoral thesis with the same professor. So it was mm. really a continuation of mm. the research that I began when I was a sophomore. Mm. Right. So that goes back to my earlier point about it was opportunistic at some level, mm. right? Although it should be more planned. Mm. So I think the lesson here for for Actually. folks is things are never that linear. Right. <laughs> and I think you should allow for some non-linearity right. in your career planning and everything right. is not lockstep, right? Yeah. You're a graduate and then right. go to Harvard, go yeah, to yeah. Kinsey. Go to, right. No, it's, it's, you know, it's at some level uh, what's in front of you, what, you know, what, what gets you excited, you know, um, it's, it's kind of uh, important as well. So that's what I did. So the academia was never really my plan. Mm. And so, but getting into you know, sort of uh, business, you know, economics and how mm. that applies to the real world was something that was compelling to me. Right. And uh, and the BCG opportunity, I think, presented that. Yeah. What was that like? So, you know, there you are, you've had this wonderful experience with the engineering academy dynamic yeah. and being at, uh, like you said, keep moving, talking about mm. what's forward. And then obviously BCG, I've also been a management consultant and it's also a little bit different, right? I yeah. don't think it's exact. there's a lot of best practices. There's a lot of comparison. It's about, you know, it's a little different, I think, in terms of how they orient the dynamic. So how did you feel about your time, what you learned from that experience in terms of compare and contrast yeah. to that of MIT? I think, I think MIT, you know, uh, and, and engineering and, and all that stuff was very precise, mm. right? It did teach me to be clear uh, in terms of what the conviction is around, you know, a theory, a thesis, again, it's still very much first principles driven, mm. right? And how we think about the work, that remains to be the case in BCG, mm. right? There's a lot of first principles thinking. Right. But at the same time, there was the need to be comfortable with a lack of precision. Right. right? Uh, a lot of work are deductive. A lot mm. of work uh, are, hey, thesis hypothesis driven, mm. right? With no clear answer necessarily, um, but just different options. Right. Right. So I think that was the hardest, you know, steepest part of the learning curve for me. Right. Where things are so un imprecise. Mm. Right. My first uh, uh, case team consists of three people. Mm. Uh, me, a PhD. <laughs> uh, we have a um, another person who is more like a computer science graduate, but he have done some work in Oracle, mm. and then we have a lawyer mm -hmm. right, who was leading the case team. Three completely different kind of training, different personalities and different, you know, sort of view of how, you know, the world looks like, right? Mm. And so that was very interesting. Mm. Uh, lawyers would think about all the options, 
mm. right? Through A, B, C, and D, <laughs> you know, and think about that. As an engineer, I look for any one option that works, and then the rest I couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, kind of looking for that, yeah. bootstrapping for the answer, and yeah. then try to iterate from there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas the lawyer would think about all the possible scenarios, right, and sure everything right. is covered. Right, and then uh, the Oracle management guy is obviously, you know, more comprehensive. I guess. Yeah. You know, how do I get this to the point where it's, it's polished? Yeah. But it was a great experience. It was a great experience. I think to be able to be in a boardroom, right, uh, with some of the top management, senior executive C suite in the world. Mm. And we're talking about you know some of the pinnacles of some of the industries in the U.S. Mm. Obviously, in the world, possibly mm. as well, uh, was was amazing. Right, right. In the dynamics, the way people think about things, mm. talk about things, the language of business. Right. Mm. I think that was one of the key takeaway for me. From there, you know, from BCG, that's where you slowly kind of left and eventually made your way into technology. Uh, in different forms and fashion, right? Where you kind of combine both of them in a much more, you know, synthesized way. So, could you sh share about how that journey happened? There's always this linkage back to you know um, the internet, right. right? The network, the computer, and everything. And I think that remember this was the late '90s, the first dot com kind of uh, uh, wave. There's a lot of energy around right. using the internet for interesting stuff. Right. Um, so I was connected with an MIT PhD mm. in computer science, uh, whose focus was in machine learning mm. and artificial intelligence. And my office mate at BCG, who is a Harvard MBA, mm. uh, also knows him. And so mm. the three of us decided to, uh, you know, start a business called Reputation mm. Systems. Mm. Um, we do have a couple of really top-notch engineers at MIT as well. Mm. Uh, one of them is uh, Roger Dingadine, which right. I still remember. He's the founder of the Tor Network, T-O-R. Right. If you yeah. ever go look it up, you'll yeah. find out who he is. Yeah. Uh, and so we have some really top-notch computer scientists right. on the team. The idea was to build a, um, a system uh, to predict uh, reputation and behaviors mm. of uh, players on marketplaces. Mm. Right. So think of B2B marketplaces, right. think suppliers, right? Thousands and thousands of them that you've not transacted with before, mm. but might have some history. And then you are about to issue a PO, right. a purchase order. Right. Right. How do you decide which one to give to? Right. Assuming all things being equal. Right. And so there's the idea right, to use machine learning, to use the techniques of machine learning to solve for those mm. uh, reputational issues mm. in an open marketplace. Right. So that was the first. Uh, startup that I got involved in. Right. In 2000, yeah. Wow. And how was that? Like, was uh, that journey like? Yeah, it was early days of the internet, so that's how crazy it was. One of our first partner was Alibaba. We were introduced to Alibaba uh, in, in, uh, in China back then, in Hong Kong. And the idea was to apply our systems on their you know, marketplaces. Mm. But the, rea the reality was back then, it was so early, there was so little data. Mm. And truth be told, most of Alibaba's business model was still providing a listing of suppliers, not right. transactions. Right. And so without data, as you probably know now, you, know, you can't do meaningful right. machine learning. Right. So we pivoted and uh, we pivoted to selling software to folks who do have the data. And these are, you know, sort of uh, um, um, large companies. Right. And so I was a BD guy, partnerships, you know, uh, conversations, et cetera. And we did secure our first customer, which was Nike, right. uh, the shoemaker out in Oregon mm. in year 2001, early 2001. Wow. So <laughs> we pivoted, yeah. Right? Uh, we won the last guys to get funded. At that point, you know, the dot-com crash <sighs> was coming. Yeah has already begun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously 9-11 happened and then Neil was really kind of like, you know, sort of well into the uh, the coffin. Yeah. The dot-com year. So. Oof. What was it like watching the uh, dot-com crash? I mean, was it scary? Was Did people know that was happening? How did it feel like as an operator on the ground watching that happen? Because I think people today, all the founders today are looking yeah. at it, myself included, as like a historical fact, right? Um, yeah. Like Black Friday. or yeah. yeah. So so clearly anything that goes up can come down. Right. right? That's something that people are kind of quite clear about. Um, secondly, secondarily, I think um, substance matter. And I think, you know, the ability to demonstrate substance and traction and sustainability of the business 
truly was one of the things that I got out of that. Mm. Right, regardless of what the cycle is, and I went through the 2002 to 2009 mm. sort of relatively colder period mm. of the tech world. Right, right, uh, where people are just so focused on substance mm. and sustainability. Right, the up cycle, the down cycle. The only thing that truly matters, right, are the basic first principles right. of business. Right, are people paying you more than you are paying to get it <laughs> out there? Yeah. Simple, yeah, right. And is there more than one person willing to pay you for that? <laughs> and not just your mom. <laughs> uh, and then it goes on from there. So it's pretty straightforward. And I don't think that has changed. I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. Yeah, right. Even now, as we are kind of experiencing uh, some level of exuberance mm. in the market right now, it's good to keep those things in mind. Mm. And one interesting thing is you went through this experience, startup as an operator, and eventually you started transitioning and building out a career in venture capital, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess the first question is why transition and start exploring the venture capital route uh, mm. from your perspective? Yeah. Um, so I did a few more startups and had the opportunity to work mm. across the, the desk, the table mm. from VCs, mm. uh, some really good ones from you know the US on Sand Hill Road. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a little bit of the exposure in terms of how that work is being done. Mm. And after a few startups, two things, one, the opportunity presented itself where I had the, the chance to apply my network, uh, my knowledge, experience in operating startups to become the, the lead of a, a government-owned VC fund here in Singapore. Mm. So that was the opportunity. Mm. And secondly, I think it speaks partly also to my other part of my, I think, uh, uh, personality and mm. bias, which is to do, to be exposed to a lot of things, you mm. know, and go back to first principles, mm. and really get curious about every single thing that I come across. Right, right, and so I think the VC experience really presented that opportunity, mm. Uh, mm. which turned out to be quite true for me personally. Mm -hmm. And so um, that the first VC role that I took on was to be the CEO of Infocom Investments. Mm. This was in 2010, mm. um, which is a co-investment strategy, mm. right? Series B, Series C, and, right. uh, and we work with the top VCs in the world, right, mm. to bring some of the good companies, top companies to to Asia, right, right, as a co-investor to uh, to these VCs. Mm. So yeah, that was how it happened. And what was that transition like for you? Because there you are on, you know, having had experience on one side of the table mm. and now you're on the other side of the table, right? <laughs> so uh, what was that transition like for yourself? It's interesting. I think once you look at this, I, I realize there's always a, a life cycle, emotional life cycle when you come across a deal, mm. right? When you see something you really like and there's this implicit kind of... Uh, emotional bias to try to justify why this is a good deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned to kind of step back and let it simmer and maybe cool down a little bit and re-examine as objectively as possible. Again, using a very first principles kind of thinking around that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was learned through mistakes. That's learned through losing money. That's <laughs> learned through companies that you were so sure about that just didn't work out. Right. A lot of these deals that were done and then you go, you know, sort of justify why these are good deals with theories and hypotheses mm. that sounded great on paper. Right. But the bottom line is, you know, uh, all the first principle stuff we talked about before. Mm. And so I think those, those are kind of uh, the key transition. Right? Yeah. As a, an ex-operator, you want to believe. Right. And when you do believe, you believe really, really hard right. in something. Right. Right. That's the nature of an optimist right. founder or <laughs> right. operator, right? Right. At least stage founder. Yeah. But at the same time, I think, you know, weighing that balancing that with just knowing what can go wrong right and being quite you know sort of uh, clear-headed about uh, the balance of everything and then making the decisions still learning i mean it's you know it's not done yet it never is done so when you say that you, you know the learning isn't done yet what would you say that you've learned so far so one of the things you've learned is mm. about how to see about emotional bias what would you say is things you feel like you've learned so far mm. versus things that you feel like you're still learning or seeking to learn? I think what I've realized was kind of helpful in going back to my you know training as a PhD student, as a graduate student, was to really be able to demarcate between first principles and things that should always be questioned. 
Mm. Mm. Right. Uh, it's a fine line, right, to know what that means. Right. Right. Certain things you just go, you know, if this works, if these are the first set of this uh, set of first principles you believe in, most things can be derived from that because the first principles are typically quite immutable. Right. But it was also the role of a researcher, an explorer, etc., to question the status quo. Right. So one thing that I learned investing now over time is to always question the status quo. Mm -hmm. So what we saw, for example, what I saw maybe a few years ago that didn't work, mm. doesn't mean it wouldn't work now. So the propensity to go, oh, you know, I've seen this before, it didn't work, nah, it wouldn't work. It's a dangerous shortcut. Mm. Until you're proven wrong, then you go, well, it actually <laughs> can work, <laughs> right? Just because the first yeah. principles are X, Y, Z yeah. remains the same, but the environment might have changed. Right. Right. So I think to be really cognizant of that intellectually is something that, you know, we continue to want to do, to be able to do. Imagine, and you know this, we see 20, 30, 40, 80 deals a week sometimes. And you just want to get through with it, right? And how do you, you rely on some, you know, sort of quite primal instincts, mm. right? You've seen right. this before, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, move on. Right. And so the ability to kind of step back as much as you can, applying curiosity and first principles, maybe to dig a little bit deeper, to doubt your instincts could be helpful. Right. Obviously easier said than done, <laughs> right? When you have so many things to look through. Right. But it is important to keep that in mind. On that note, you know, when you think about instincts, it has a lot of folks who, you know, are thinking through, right? Which is, as a founder, you're thinking, how do I appeal to the VC's instincts, right? You know, so because and how do I storytell better? How do I make my company look better to appeal to those instincts, mm -hmm. right? And then the secondary question is like, what is the actual business and the core of that business? Mm -hmm. How do you advise founders? Because you've been on both sides, right? You've been a founder yeah. and operator before, and now you're on a VC side of it, and you've also been a coach to working alongside these founders as mm -hmm. well. So how do you help them, uh, or how would you coach founders be thinking through, right? To be you know, thinking through both the bull and the bear markets, whatever they be, how would you advise them to be thinking about going out to fundraise yeah. or to think about storytelling? <laughs> So, um, so first of all, yeah, absolutely, you know, uh, a founder should be thinking about all the up and down bull and bear cases and all the possible things that can go wrong and what success should look like and what it, it takes or what are two, three main levers and main success factors that you really got to nail to mm. win the game, mm. right? I mean, those things need to be quite clear. My personal recommendation, and this really depends on individuals and and all of that, my recommendation is to be quite open book, mm. right, with the investor you're talking to. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's the game's an exercise in convincing and selling the other person, but you gotta remember this is more than a transaction. Mm. You're getting to something that's long standing, right? Right, hopefully and possibly and very likely long standing. And so it's important to lay the cards to make sure that everybody is aware about what the boundary conditions are the upside, downside, risk, et cetera, before you get into a relationship and collaboration. Mm. Um, VCs are adults, right? Mm. VCs should be able to calibrate the risk and decide this is something that they want to do, mm. right? Eyes wide open. I think the last thing that I think founders should try to do is to sell a VC mm. too hard mm. and, and revel in having sold to the VC, right? Yeah. I think it's more important to having come to the, on the same page as this VC, having the same thought process, expectations about the business, same excitement about the business mm. uh, as the start of that relationship. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I would recommend founders to do, to yeah. be quite open book, to be quite clear about you know the extents of the businesses mm. uh, with the uh, investors. Uh, on that note, I'd love to wrap up the you know this great episode by mm. summarizing the three big themes I got away from this. Uh, the first is thank you so much for sharing your early years. I think the theme keep moving actually is a great theme uh, for all of it, uh, for how you kept moving through uh, your early years as a student, as a playing uh, softball and soccer, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, as a science and physics and engineer uh, and eventually PhD and consultant. So I love that keep moving segment. 
especially that culture of experimentation and being at the frontier of knowledge as a computer help desk uh, dynamic. Uh, so love that uh, set of experiences. Uh, second, is thank you so much for also sharing uh, what you learn as a professional uh, around questioning the status quo. And I think you shared, I think, the boundaries between uh, first principles thinking and how you learn that in different domains from physics to business to also how you think about it from inductive versus deductive reasoning uh, in the business uh, context slash economics um, and eventually venture capital. So that's interesting. And a third, I think that we touched on very briefly uh, is actually, I think some of your thoughts about why you joined venture capital, which is to some extent because you got to work alongside them because the opportunity presented itself. And also some of the learnings that you had around what it means to truly align and you know create value together and have that be a true partnership uh, between uh, everybody. So uh, thank you so much, Kawaii, for sharing all your thoughts uh, on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the MHV podcast, please share this episode with your friends and colleagues. Go to www.monkshill.com for more founders' journeys, company building advice, and insights into regional tech trends.